paranormal Karen. She's so spooky, paranormal Karen. Funny too, paranormal Karen. She's so spooky. Oh, and did I mention she's funny too? Yeah, cha cha cha. Hey everybody, welcome to Paranormal Karen. Um, thanks everybody. I think we made it to February. Uh, Y'all know I tape early, but it's good. We made it to February. And uh, I'm very excited about my guest today. Uh, all the way from England. I know sometimes we do healers and sometimes we do spooky stuff. Today uh, we are going to talk about uh, Richard Case, Case says, Case says plural, um, ghost encounters from all over the world. All the way from, is it over the pond is that how you say it was that what i'm supposed to say richard you're uh, uh over the yeah pond? yeah i would say i would say over the pond i often say that so over the pond yeah <laughs> well wonderful <laughs> i am always so curious i know you've gone all over the world but i'm always so curious about england because i feel like um you know united states is like a little baby country we just did uh, sure. 200 years old my friend has a funny joke where he says all these other countries, we're like the drunk kid in the bar swinging a bottle around, <laughs> and the rest of you are like, just wait, let him tire himself out. Um, so tell me first, how did you get into this uh, ghost hunting paranormal field? Well, it was probably going back to my grandfather. He was um, well known for... Um, I guess spooking his grandson at night, you know. But and I was a, I was terrible because I always wanted to be, you know, have a spooky tale, even though I used to dread it every time he told me a spooky story. But um, I would often say to him, "Granddad, tell me a ghost story," you know, before I went to bed, and he'd tell me about doppelgangers, you know, the, the when you see a double of yourself. Yeah. Um, he would tell me about. Um, he, he told me one story. He said. Um, where we are down in the cottage because he moved to the cottage down at uh, further down in England. And he said down there, um, I have seen your grandmother. I mean, my grandmother was deceased. He said, I have seen your grandmother at the top of the stairs. Now, when I was a child, I went to stay at that bungalow and they had this spiral staircase. Mm. So you can imagine I used to go up that spiral staircase as a child, hands on eyes, hoping not to bump into the apparition of my grandmother. Um, and that was how powerful his stories were. Um, so, yeah, I think I kind of got interested really from that. And and from a young age, it sounds strange, but I can remember saying to my granddad, well, I don't remember saying this, but apparently they used to have the old air raid shelters in um, some of the parks in, in England, mm -hmm. and some of them were still there. And one day we shouted from a thunderstorm, and I must have been only a toddler, and he turned around to me and went home. He said to my mum, do you know what he just said? He said, we're sheltering from the bombs. And he said, but how does he know about the bombs? <gasps> so he told me that later in life. And it kind of made me think about reincarnation. And, you know, did I have a previous life that I didn't know about? So mm -hmm. it opened up a lot of questions, really. And that's how I really got interested in it. So you were already a little bit in tune, so to speak, and it just got uh, bigger. You know, it's funny. I am not a fan of the spiral staircase at all. No. For no. a couple of reasons is a lot of times they have strange uh handrails. I'm not I'm not afraid of a lot of things. I don't like <laughs> when there's not a handrail. Even if I'm not using it, I don't like it. But it's funny because energetically I think they tend to form vortexes. Yeah, I mean I I've done a, a haunted church back in the UK and the handrails disintegrated because the church is so ancient. So um I went to the top of the spiral staircase in this church and I heard what sounded like a groan in the darkness above me. And that was the one moment I kind of lost my nerve and I want, wanted to get out as quickly as possible. And coming back down a stone spiral staircase with no uh, nothing to grip onto was quite quite strange. But you're right. I think a lot of people do say that, that, that there is almost like a, an energy around them that, that, that causes that kind of feeling yeah there's a house here that's in there in the historic houses and it has that spiral and it just um you can look all the way up i don't know i should figure out the feng shui in that so um so you st so as a kid you're sort of or you already have the curiosity you already have everything going on so how did you make that next leap into investigating well i kind of started with a thing called um evp i was very much into electric voice phenomena so I always used to use the old tape recorders to kind of record uh, haunted locations and see if I got anything back. And there was one particular moment where I did record and I had a voice come back as clear as day. I mean, I said I, 
I, I'm asking you with the utmost respect, is anyone here? And I had a voice as clear as day come back, we know. And it said, and I, what, what intrigued me about that was, I do know that, you know, from a psychological perspective, you can hear a jumble of noise. Someone could play you a jumble of noise, means nothing at all. Once they tell you what it means, you hear it. And that's just, uh, there's a psychological reason for that. Matrixing, so um, I think they call it or something where you yeah, put it together. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But this wasn't like that. This was as clear as day, a, a deep voice going, we know. And I thought, well, was it, did I say it myself or, you know, and I knew it come from nowhere. So it was really quite intriguing. So I got more and more intrigued with it. But my family are very religious and I kind of uh, question religion because I, I kind of have a healthy respect for it. But I thought, well, if I was brought up in China, I probably wouldn't, you know, be a Christian. Or if I was brought up in, you know, the Native American uh, society, I would believe in different things. So I questioned religion. I also questioned what is it all about? You know, what is out there? Is, is, is it true? Why do we believe in these things? So I had that intrigue to know why do we believe yeah, you know, it's interesting too. Um uh and I want to go back to a question about EVPs with you. Um I always think it's it religion is very interesting in that um it, tr- it they tend to not want you to ask and have that curiosity. Yet I find yeah. whenever I'm investigating with someone who was a Mormon, was brought up Mormon or was brought up I just found out my friend was brought up um uh what are they in Pennsylvania? They're not Quakers, they're um uh, Amish. She's brought up Amish. Uh, uh, Amish, yeah. The Amish they, yeah, community, yeah. Yes, and they've all left those communities, but they all seem to have some extra protection. I know that sounds weird, yeah. but I feel like there's something about being born into that where you kind of come with an extra shield, and even if you leave, it sort of follows. Very true, because my family were um, – well, my, my, I'm, I'm – I'm, uh, I'm kind of the son of the postman. So the postman always rings twice, I think, comes into. <laughs> um, um, I'm the black sheep of the family. And <laughs> I was brought up and um, basically found out that all my brothers and sisters were my half brothers and sisters. And I was brought up in a, in a in Salvation Army, which is um, known in the States and known in the UK. And um, they were very much like that. So when I turned to looking into ghosts, I was very much shunned and, you know, looked upon even worse than what I am, you know, wow. being the black sheep of the family. Oh, that's too bad, but it probably gave you that independence. Like sometimes Oh, yes, I, definitely. Yeah, not feeling like part of the group can give you that independence. You know, there's a, I think it's a very different situation, but Jack Nicholson was brought up by his aunt and was told that his mother was his sister. I'm way off topic. Yeah, So yeah. I wanted to get back to a question. Um, how did you find out about EVPs? Because I think most people found out about them from television, but it sounds like you knew way before that. Was there, uh, were people just doing that already in England, or how did you find out to do that? Well, to be honest with you, I've always read a lot of books from a young age, and I've run, read a lot of Hans Holzer and... Um, all the famous um, people in, in, the, in, the, in the business, and I, I read a lot of their books. And um, we used to have a wonderful magazine over in the UK when I was young called um, Unexplained. Mm. And they used to have these um, the old record discs, you know, so you put the record, or oh, good grief, you know, the old vinyls. So you put it on the, the record turntable and you could play, play the voices of the dead, so to speak, and you'd have Winston Churchill and people like that. So that kind of made me think, well, that's fantastic. I mean, if you could really get a voice, you know, how did these people do it? So I kind of got intrigued by that. And also there was Breakthrough, um, which was um, done by, um, now the name, I'm getting to that age where names do slip. <laughs> that's slip all right, we're not going to check you, know? you. We're not going to fact check but, you, so. <laughs> yeah. But, but there, there was a wonderful book out called Breakthrough, and I, and I read a lot of those books as well. Uh, you know what's funny, too, about that EVP we know? That leads you to believe there's more than one. It did. And, and also what I did say to somebody was it was rather strange. It was almost as if they were saying to me, I mean, the impression I got, even though I'm a skeptic, because I very much am a skeptic, but even though that did happen, and I still think, you know, when I say I'm a skeptic, I still sometimes say, well, it could have been the wind. It could have been this. It could have been that, you know. Um, but I I did think to myself, it was almost as if they were saying, we know that you're doing this the right way. And we know that this is something you're going to 
do for the rest of your life and you know we're going to communicate to you I, I just had that feeling that it was kind of almost saying we know we've been waiting for you kind of thing that's awesome so all ghost hunters please listen to that we go in with respect always um let let ghost adventures run in yelling they can do that and we'll, we'll watch it <laughs> but don't do that so then you're I, i'm guessing your curiosity becomes so big you start to want to travel all over and investigate all over that's correct yeah i wanted to see what it was like in other countries because England is a wonderful place, as you, as you say, and we've got a wonderful history. Um, but I found the USA, I found that equally interesting. And funnily enough, often what people say that are in the UK is, I'd love to live in the USA because I'd love to go stunt over there. And vice versa, the people in the USA say, I'd love to be over in England with all your history. <laughs> <Yeah>. So we, <laughs> the green is not, the grass is not always greener. But we, um, I, I definitely wanted to go around the world and see what it was like for other cultures and other places in the world. And, and so what, uh, well, of course, this is going to be the question everyone asks. What is probably your favorite place or the scariest place? Like uh, everybody has that one story where you go, oh, um, what would be yours? I think it's, um, I think the probably the one scariest place I did was in the, was in England, actually. Um, funnily enough, I've been to Alcatraz and I mean, I'll talk about that uh, later on, but, 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 um, it wasn't, I mean, it was scary, but this place was more scary for me. Um, this was a place called Kelvin Hatch, which is in England. And it's an old, um, it was made as a nuclear war bunker. If ever there was a nuclear war. So, um, luckily we never had a nuclear war and the bunker was never used. And what's, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story to that. It's called a secret nuclear bunker. And they've got a sign about 10 miles away saying this way to the secret nuclear bunker. So I always joked, it can't be much of a, much of a secret <laughs> nuclear bunker. So, uh, um, but um, I, went, I went into the bunker and basically what it was about that was they told me that the um, ghost or, or where it was happening was supposed to be right at the bottom of the bunker, right towards the, to, to the end of the bunker. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to leave you in there completely on your own because that's how I do it. And we're going to shut the door. And our challenge to you is to go from the top to the bottom. So normally you'd be coming away from whatever's haunted and getting out of the top and breathing a sigh of relief. That wasn't the case for me. I had to go from the top right towards whatever it was at the bottom of the bunker. So it was a long way back. So um, that was deep underground. So, um, And also there were mannequins all around me because it was um, – you know, mannequins of prime ministers, if there had been a nuclear war, what the place was used for. So when you were going around, I only had a lantern with me. I was going around and these mannequins suddenly appeared out of the darkness towards me. So, oh. so it was quite strange. It made you jump a mile. But what was, what was interesting, I mean, that it's an old YouTube thing now. I'm going to improve on the filming, to be honest, but I've, I've I only done very basic filming. But what looks like a shadow, passes me by in the, the in the the tunnel and somebody did the research on evp and apparently the words were we want him or something like that so it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't too uh too uh nice what they what, whatever they were uh was it up in with. a so, different language no it was it was in um it, it was england it was in the the english um language oh. um yeah i mean that, that that's something i will go on to that does intrigue me what you just said about languages um, because often we do see on these tv programs that conveniently they may be in the other side of the world and it always speaks english <laughs> yeah <laughs> the translator um, the google translation works in the ether i guess um yeah um well you know uh yeah because that is actually an interesting topic and something that we did here in the united states um but i have to go back because I, you know, it's funny because I will make fun of, uh, I'll, I'll make fun of our industry, but I do have a lot of respect for the guys like Ghost Adventures. And I know people come to me that aren't really ghost hunters and they'll say, oh, that's all fake or whatever. And I love to take them somewhere and hand them either the uh, night vision camera or just a lantern, lock them in and go, all right, you try it. You, because people yeah, don't yeah. realize that is well. Number one, it's really it's always scary. It's always scary. Yeah, and your senses are so heightened. Um, yeah, that I can't imagine this bunker and with faces of mannequins. What? Wh I don't think I can yeah. do that. 
Yeah, it's um, it is, and I mean, it's like um, the the famous um, TV show that we have over in England called Most Haunted. Um, Yvette Fielding was left in a a pub in England, and um, they turned off all the um, all the all the pumps and everything in in the you know in the cellar so that it, it, they they could film without any noise or anything like that. So it was deadly silent in the cellar. So. You know, I've been in the cellar that she went into, and and it is quite an eerie cellar. So, you know, I I I understand that television is is entertainment, but often, you know, uh, the the things that happen, they, they do happen. Yeah, I I always tell everyone about TV. I say the producers know the outcome. The producers know the outcome, but what happens in between? Some of it could be real, some of it could be set up. But I don't never I don't write off. The whole, you know what I mean? They're doing something. And yeah, like I said, yeah. just the bravery of where these people go for such long periods of time, it, I'm a fan uh, because I don't know that I could. But when you go alone, um, I always I always say, don't go alone. Have you ever uh, really had something attack or follow you home? Well, funny enough, when I did all this, I, I used to have a team as well. And um, I did work with a load of, psychic mediums and, and and you know i i've been to what they they call um rescue where they rescue people with they've got attachments so i thought well if i'm going to get involved in this even though i'm a bit of a skeptic i better understand the subject better understand everything i'm doing so um i always go i mean i do it on my own but i always go with a uh, a good frame of mind i think that's so important you know um i strongly advise people that have got any you know, um, they're feeling depressed one day. Don't go. If you're feeling like that, avoid a paranormal investigation. Only go when you're, a, you know, you're in a good mind or a good place. Because, you know, I've been there when I, where I would certainly wouldn't go out and, and investigate. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I've always gone with an open mind, and I've always been um, fairly uh, good in knowing when to challenge, not to challenge. And um, I must admit, there was one time where. Um, I've been doing it quite often and it, it did get a little bit much. And, um, I was in this old, um, uh, pub in, in Wales, um, uh, near England and it's out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, they left me there and, um, I was just there by myself and suddenly towards the end of the evening, it sounded like this, this something ran up the stairs towards me and came towards the door that I was in. So I shut the door. Now, I've come across this kind of thing once more, once before in my life. When I was a teenager, <laughs> typical teenager, the parents are out. I'm going to get the beer in. I'm going to have a party, you know. <laughs> and um, I can remember this experience that something came up the stairs, and it was almost like it was going to push the door. I felt the door had been pushed, and something was out there. And I thought, oh, it must be my uh, – my older sisters, you know, they've come around to tell me off or something, you know. Um, and But I was scared because I thought it was, it was there because I was only a teenager. Opened the door and nobody was there. And I joked and thought perhaps it was my the spirit of my great uncle telling me off for having a few beers when they were out or something like that. Now, I had the same experience at this inn that something ran up and pushed the door. And uh, for some reason, that unnerved me. And for the rest of the night, I turned the lights out and uh, said to her, when the live feed's finished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that actually, that's a funny, a funny story. There's a place in my hometown of Massachusetts. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but Houghton Mansion. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sounds- oh, yeah. Houghton Mansion. Well, it's in North Adams. And uh, it's so funny because I had a... Um, you know, this is a this is a little gossipy about paranormal teams, and I don't mean any one in particular, except for the one that was watching that at the time. They, but but I always think paranormal teams they tend to the paranormal community tends to fight within itself more than other oh, communities, yeah. and I always feel like um, because the first thing I try to wipe away with any investigation is ego. Don't go in with ego, yeah. and I think people go in and it gets interesting because you know that feeling when you get your first evp you're like okay i'm into this forever it's like nothing else um but i feel like they get dark things around them maybe attached maybe not and then all of a sudden everybody's fighting because they go in with the wrong feeling it's a very very um it's, it's something that i think 
a lot of people starting to look at more now because the paranormal field is full of it. You know, um, people are falling out and, and um, people are giving up having re- research teams because so-and-so doesn't like doing it anymore. I mean, I've seen members of my own team that I've got on fine with and we've, we've really got on and no, no upset, nothing. And suddenly they don't like you anymore. They don't want anything to do with it. And it's nothing you've done or said, but they've just lost it. They, they've gone to a haunted location. And, it, and like you say, it's almost as if the negativity has taken over and they're, and they've gone if, gone in for the wrong reasons and they've had a big wake-up call. So, yeah, I, I have seen that happen a lot in, in the field. Yeah. And uh, hang on, folks. We'll be right back. I'm going to tell you my Houghton Mansion story. Okay. Be right back. Hey, everybody. You know I only bring you the best in readers and healers, and that's why I'm here to talk about Paul Jasek. Paul was the guy you all went nuts for on the New Year's Prediction Show, as you should. He was fantastic. He's one of my favorite people, and not only is he a reader, he's also an entertainer. So when When you book with him, you know you're in for some fun as well. He's not only accurate, he's one of the most compassionate human beings I've ever met, which means he can tell you how it is without scarring you for life. We all know those readers that blurt stuff out or try to work out their own shadow side on us. That's not Paul. Paul is going to give you the information you need and have you walking away inspired. That's Paul Jasek. You can book with him at www.paul.com. P-A-U-L, Jacek, J-A-C-E-K dot com. Okay, so I um, so Houghton Mansion was this place in North Adams, and there was a um, a team that that's the other thing they tend to do. They tend to uh, take a location. A, a team will take a location and make them make it theirs, and then you always have to ask them to go in. Um, that happens yeah. a lot in this country. So this place in North Adams, I really wanted to get in, and they weren't answering emails, and then they were kind of short with me. So I called my cousin that lived in North Adams, and I said, "Hey, I want to." make a funny tape. How about we make uh, two middle-aged women trying to break into a haunted house and we go to Houghton <laughs> Mansion and she says, or I could just open it because I have the key. Um, because I didn't know North Adams is so small. She worked for the school system and she had the key, and which was fantastic. We had the most wonderful investigation. Sure, sure. But they, <laughs> when Ghost Adventures had gone there, this is the interesting thing about um, sort of setting the mood again. When Ghost Adventures had gone there, they had interviewed everybody and they had very small amount of stories, but nothing big. But um, when Ghost Adventures was in there, um, something came running up the stairs and knocked on the door. Exactly like you're saying, running up the stairs, knocked on the sure. door, pushed yeah. on it. Well, after Ghost Adventures, two weeks after Ghost Adventures left, that had never happened before. Now, this woman that I know was teaching upstairs. Sure enough, run something runs up the stairs and bangs on the door. And I think there are certain vibrations of people that activate or um, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Because I've seen that when I've done, um, you know, we've done locations and I've seen things happen and uh, things almost move. And, you know, it's uh, like a telekinesis that, that, that you're making it happen. You're making things happen within the room. I mean, I was, um, um, I interviewed Uri, Uri Geller. Mm. And Uri Geller is a wonderful guy who bent spoons. And I often asked him, you know, are we creating the haunting? And he, he, he said, you know, I think we are sometimes, you know, we're creating what's happening around us. Wow. He, boy, I, you know, you're, he's such an interesting guy. I Have you ever done spoon bending? I've not. Jury bent a spoon for me, which was fantastic. He, oh. um, he, be, he bent the spoon and signed it because I went to his house and, um, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to spend a spoon for you. And he bent the spoon. He said, there you are signed it. And I thought, he didn't even touch the spoon. His finger was just above it, you know? Um, wow. And I really could not work out how he did it. And he said, um, he said, you're a skeptic. He said, you still don't believe. But he said, he said, you, you still find it hard to believe. I said, well, you know, I'm still looking. I said, all I could bring you was a plastic spoon from the, uh, <laughs> from the service station. That wouldn't have been any good. <laughs> you know, that's, I took a parapsychology class um, with uh, Lloyd Arbach, who's just fascinating. And they... Oh, he's great, yeah. I think he... I don't know if it was Yuri, but they had a spoon that someone bent, and they literally took it to the lab and put it under the microscope. And they said if someone had bent it, the... Um, I 
I don't know, I'm, I'm filling in words here, but the way the, I guess, cells or whatever laid against it, sure. had just yeah. bent it, they would have been broken, but it actually was melted. The guy said, no, this would, yeah. you would have had to heat this up so much. Um, but it's funny because I so want to learn that, and I bought a box of spoons, and then I thought, well, you're really very optimistic if you have more than one spoon for a spoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, let's get back. Let's go back to language with ghosts, the language. Yeah. Um, so we used to investigate an, a hospital in East L.A., but we always brought someone that spoke Spanish. Um, do you speak other languages, or when you go to other places, do you try to know phrases in their language? Unfortunately, no with languages. I, know, I, mean, I, I knew basic French, but I'm trying to learn languages. Um, Latin is something I'm also studying because Latin, the old Latin is quite good. Um, but um, no, I, I don't. So if I do get anything that comes through that I think maybe, then obviously um, – it's great now because you can get people to translate it and, 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 and various other things because I haven't yet had that. Um, when I went to the Philippines and all these other places, there were occasions where I tried EVP, but then I didn't get any EVP that I could, could, could recognize or any, or, or, or the sound of a voice anyway. So, um, so no, but, but I think that is an interesting one languages. I think it, it will happen, you know, that if you go to, a, to, I don't know, for example, if you're in China, you're going to get a Chinese speaking apparition or you would thought you would get something speaking or a spirit speaking to you in that kind of language or, or you know, whatever. Mm. I've only gotten one that was Russian and I have a friend that said it was grandma because very, very clear. You like a brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know what, when you go to a country like the Philippines, like, um, that just fascinates me. So you you go to the Philippines on a trip directly to do um, investigating. Do you find out about the folklore? How do you find about the places? How do you how do you go about getting your your sort of target area? Well, what I do is I um I decided to go around the world, and um, like anyone, I had to use a form of transport to get around the world. So unfortunately, the only way I could really do it at a good price was going by a cruise ship. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, so I kind of went aboard as a passenger on a world cruise, but my job, my my cruise was more of a work uh, busman's holiday, you know. So I was kind of uh, going round, and I decided, well, wherever we land, I'm going to get the taxi to the most remotest place and i'm going to research it and google and look up everything and find out and also pre what i did was i contacted people before i went to know where to go and and i spoke to local people so it was amazing what you can do just just by doing that um and um the philippines was amazing because i mean some of the um cabin crew on the ship were from the philippines and uh, they already told me places to go when I landed and told me about their beliefs. And um, what you find about these people, especially in the in Asia as well, is that they already have this kind of assumption that ghosts are just there amongst us all the time. You know, they unlike us in the West where we kind of like question or, you know, they're like, well, they're there. You know, it's not a surprise to us, you know. Um, Obviously, where you go more towards the city, they they're they're like us. They say, "Oh, probably not true," or it "May not be true." But um, when you go into the villages, I mean, they really, really believe in it. And um, one of the uh, one of the actual um, ghosts that well, it's a kind of a thing they believe is more like a vampire. Um, it's actually like the form of a woman who's got no um, legs. And all that's sticking out from the bottom is their entrails. It sounds disgusting, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, this um, is like a vampire ghost. It's got a very long tongue, and it's supposed to um, feed on the woman womb of a pregnant lady. It sounds quite gross. Um, so what they do is a lot of their houses were built on stilts. So they would put um, like uh, they would put sort of um, shells on the on the on the stilts and and um, corals on the stilts, so that if she ever climbed the the, the building, her entrails would be caught in these um, these, um, these shells and that, and wouldn't be able to uh, affect or or attack the the pregnant woman. So they very much believe in that over there. Oh, fascinating! You know, I just found out that's why bells are on stores. 
uh, yeah. doors for to to keep uh, bad energy out. That's fascinating. Shell. Oh wow. Well, that's like why we make noises at New Year's Eve, and we make banging pots and pans in England and all around. It's just that it was years ago to get to ward off um, evil spirits, you know. And really? um, is that where? Yeah, fireworks too, or. Or, yeah, the fireworks very much come from, you know, from from um, from Asia and places like that, which were to um, ward off the evil spirits. Lots of noise. Um, if you're in a location and you're a ghost hunter and you feel that things are getting a bit much, they always used to say, "Clap your hands and make a lot of noise and frighten the spirits away." I, I think probably the it, whatever's there would probably frighten me more away. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I live in Los Angeles above a musician. Apparently, he's trying to frighten away spirits. It's 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. I have a neighbor. That has... <laughs> God. Um, do you have any other stories like that, like about the shells? I find that stuff fascinating. And this is sort of a two-part question. I'm obsessed with the Middle East. Have you ever been investigating anywhere in the Middle East? Yeah, I went to, when I went to um, the Middle East, I went to um, Petra. Um, and Petra, the lost city, is a wonderful place to go. And um, you've got the jinns, you know, they're like mm-hmm. the um, they're like the demons. They're the kind of uh, they're the bad boys. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're a lot of the um, people of the Islamic faith believe that what we see when we think we see ghosts and we go to a haunted building. A lot of my friends that are, that are, that are of the Islamic faith will say to me, "That's to to me, that's a jinn." They say, you know, that's not that's not a ghost. That's a jinn that you're seeing. We're aware of them. You shouldn't mess with them. Be careful. So they have a very different outlook on it, and then they're very they're very much. Um, it's very difficult to discuss it as well in the Middle East because obviously their religion is they're very devout about their religion, and also you know if you talk about something like that, it's more evil. It's more sinister, and you know. But I did go to a shop in uh, Jordan. And I got this wonderful um, amulet. It's um, it's a, a necklace that was worn by by um, women or adolescents when they were young. They put it around their neck, and it would protect them from the jinn. Mm. And it's got Arabic Arabic language on it, um, and it is quite amazing. That, Funny you're talking about paranormal. We have got that wind in the background. I mean, I've just noticed that. I don't know what that's coming from. Oh, yeah. it's uh, a little bit, but it, it kind of comes and goes. But it's not. Uh, it's not. An- we have got a storm in the UK at the moment, so it may be that. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny. There's actually a podcast called The Hidden Gin. Uh, I think the lady that does it is a lawyer, um, and she's yeah. Islamic, and it's fascinating. But you know, it's interesting because um, you know my night job is comedy, my day job is tarot. And sure. uh, I always, I'm really not welcome in any religion. And in Islam, they believe if you're doing tarot, you're communicating with jinn. So they yeah. throw jinn into everything. They're, like it's it's quite a um, fascinating thing. But I find that interesting that they don't really believe in ghosts. They kind of um, they kind of think everything's jinn. Yeah, and um, I mean, obviously, we we know we don't have all the answers, and maybe they. Maybe they are right, you know, um, but um, yeah, it does us. interest. Yeah, and it does interest me that. I mean, I, I know in, in India, I mean, I went to um, went to India, and I know the lady there said to me that they wouldn't go near the banyan tree at night because this banyan tree would have the evil spirits, and they believed their soul would be taken away, and they would they would stay away from it. So, and, and been in that atmosphere and been out there on your own, it's quite, you can understand how they can believe those things. Um, yeah, they, um, there was, uh, on one of her episodes that she did on the hidden gin, she talked about them, uh, territory that they like to sit under trees and like in the middle of the night, don't wake them or yeah. something like that. It's, it's pretty fascinating. It's almost a whole system, but you know, what's really weird, Richard is gin are becoming really popular. Like I, there are a lot of people talking about them. Not that that they shouldn't be, but it's it's a very odd phenomenon right now, and I think it it is attract it is weird things. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, I I know um, I know Chris um, that's um, related to you know Lorraine Warren's um, son, um, and they do do a lot of work like Lorraine Warren did with with um, mm-hmm. with the demonology and stuff like that. And sometimes you wonder if there is some kind of connection between this gin and demons. I mean, I don't go into demons because I because I'm 
because I was brought up in a very strict religion, I always found that religion would often demonize other beliefs. Do you know what I'm trying to say? They would make, you know, they would make witchcraft seem bad. They would make um, you doing the tarot bad. They would make this bad and make it seem bad. And that would almost be like a bit of propaganda on their part to Mm -hmm. make all these things look bad when really they're not that bad, you know? And so I always go with, when I hear about exorcism, I always go with an open mind and think, well, is there such a thing as a demon or is that just created by religion? But then I am intrigued by these exorcisms and what goes on with that. And um, I haven't yet attended one to, to, to witness one, but, you know, it does it, it does open questions. Well, you know, it is, uh, I did a podcast a little while back with a woman who channeled a demon, and uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, it's January 29th with Diet, if you're interested at all. But it's very yes. interesting because it sounds like there's certain levels that are just about chaos, and then there's actually the human spirit and how they used to be a teacher. Um, odd side note, and I don't know if you do a lot of research on this stuff, but People don't know, and I try to mention it all the time, Once, uh, because the Catholic Church is so against tarot, but yet they have a patron saint of psychics and mediums, and that patron saint's name is Agabus. And I yeah. search everywhere, and there is such limited information on him. I don't know if you guys have more out there, but if you, I would love it. I need to... I certainly will lower that one up because I, that that's very true though. Because when you go back to um, witchcraft in England and you go back to the Middle Ages, um, when the Reformation came, they really poo pooed the Catholic Church. They wanted everyone to go Protestant because they said the that the Catholic religion was very magical and very close to um, almost um, you know um, paganism. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, it's very possible that you know sometimes that does come into the catholic church that things are with their saints and i mean it's interesting as well because my family are very religious and you know i say to them well i research everything and they say well no you're you're um dealing with the the occult um stay away from it and i say well well not really i'm not you know i'm not going out uh you know, I haven't gone and uh, um, sacrificed a sheep or, or done right. anything right. <laughs> horrendous like that. You know, I'm researching people's beliefs. And I said, and surely an understanding of everyone's beliefs and cultures is a good thing, you know. And, um, and I, you know, I, I, I research Christianity. I research other religions as well um, with an open mind. But there is this kind of, you know, you can't go over this line and, and it is very much... And then that keeps people in line, because also Muhammad was a prophet, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, All right, so, oh my God, I'm going to take a break now. You know, uh, Richard, I don't even think uh, I've—this has been so interesting. I don't even think I have let you talk about the interesting places. That was the original topic, (laughs) and we've been talking about everything else. So I'm going to shut up the next half, and I'm just going to let you tell me about that. So everybody, hang on. We'll be right back. Psychic teas, spelled with a Z, are scrumptious herbal combinations with antiviral and anti-inflammatory properties. Without sugar or caffeine, psychic teas won't mess with any medications and are designed by a naturopathic doctor. Many testify to positive results. Detox chakras and psychic tea blends enable bodily functions with superior efficacy, while more love and champagne blends support awareness of subtle joy and bliss. The CBD's teas are magical with myriad healing effects. There are 20 servings per package, a little dabble do ya, and you can drink it hot or cold. Psychic teas taste so good. Replace coffee, use as a bedtime ritual, or even flavor a meal or dessert. The people behind the product are righteous and kind. Psychic teas will blow your mind. Totally worth the investment. Psychic teas with a Z dot com. Okay, folks, welcome back. Okay, so um, you've, uh, as I said, I love the Middle East, uh, and this is, all right, I'm getting chatty already. They used to do, um, they used to do uh, military tours, take comedians on military tours, and I, I it couldn't go at the time. But one of the places they went to was Iraq, and you would get a tour of Saddam Hussein's castle. And I'm pretty sure they would say no recording devices, but man, to just get in there and walk through with an audio recorder was my dream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that would have been amazing. I mean, I mean, it's very true. I mean, you, you think about, I mean, I, some of the people that are interested in, um, 
in ghosts. I mean, I used to be a former police officer and a lot of my friends were former military. And you would think that when they're out dealing with the, the, the war and what they have to deal with, the last thing they'd be thinking about is ghosts. But funnily enough, one of my friends that was out in uh, the Middle East and dealing with the Gulf War, one of the things that came up often was haunted bunkers and things like that that they 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 actually encountered. So there there definitely was something there, you know, even during the the height of war. Wow. Wow. All right. So tell us about all your where have you been? Tell us more interesting ways people keep yeah. ghosts away or stuff. Where, tell us everything. Well. <laughs> I think one of my favorites was Barbados. I loved it. I mean, lovely because it's warm and the, the sea is tranquil and we could do with that at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but um, I went I went to Chase Faults, which is, um, it's it's basically, uh, it's a little churchyard um, in, in Barbados and there's a little vault where they kept the family, you know, all the, all the family bodies and, you know, you, you, you put them in the vault and, and they were known as the Chase family. And what happened was, this guy used to put he, he, he's one of these relatives died. They put the two children in the vault when they died early, and when they went to put the next relative in, they go into the vault and all the all the coffins or all the all the tombs have been moved around in there. Oh. So they thought, well, we've sealed it. How's this happened? You know, why why is it all moving around? So they all put it back to normal, went back again, and it all been moved. So when I went to Barbados, I said to him, I tell you what, I said, you know this Chase Vault, I'd love to go in the vault. So this lovely um guy from Barbados said to me, Yep, I'll take you over there. Now it was open, so <laughs> it wasn't shut or anything. So it's obviously uh, time has has meant that it's opened and it's no longer kept as it was but um he let me go down inside i mean it was quite he, he wanted a few dollars to do that but that was quite interesting <laughs> <laughs> but um i was in the vaults and i did evp i didn't pick up anything but it certainly felt eerie in there i mean we talked about the the movement of the uh, coffins and that i mean a lot of that could have been to do with the earthquakes that were over there and things like that they do say now but um you know that was a really really great place to go and obviously um Hawaii was a wonderful place because um, in Hawaii, I I went out with one of the taxi drivers and he took me to a place where he had picked up a phantom hitchhiker. Um, And he said this girl had called him in the middle of the night in the mist for him to take her to the next stop. But she got in the car and as he turned around, she disappeared. And he took me to the spot where this had happened. And you could see it quite, you can imagine it quite on the night when it was quite misty and foggy and um so i went around looking at those places um samoa that was fantastic america samoa well, uh um yeah you know hawaii has so many talk about i don't know if they told you the folklore there about not whistling yeah not whistling is one of the one of the folklore. they also tell you not to whistle in a in a theater though but apparently that's because People used to whistle if the safety current come down or something, and that's why they tell you not to whistle. I think that's right, something like that. So that's where that phone calls come. So whistling was, um, and it's also unlucky in a church to whistle. Oh, I didn't know that. Because funnily enough, when I went to a haunted church, we um, we tried whistling <laughs> because we wanted to see if it would provoke. And right at the end of the evening, we heard whistling coming out of nowhere. Wow! And, All right, that's you know, interesting. I, and the lights were going on, and we could hear somebody whistling. And I'm looking around, and none of the people were whistling. So I rushed outside to see if there was anyone outside. But um, that was intriguing. But yeah, no, I've been to Samoa, I've been to New Zealand, I've been to Australia, um, China. I went to Hong Kong. I went to Namkoon Terrace, which is which used to be a Japanese brothel. And um, always a brothel. The, the, Brothels always tend to leave something behind. I don't know if people go well, there. It, you know, they're always a brothel or a abortion clinic the funny <laughs> the funny thing about that was my wife was left on the ship when i went off and somebody said where's your husband gone and she said oh he's oh he's gone off to look at a haunted brothel <laughs> so um i think i raised a few eyebrows on the ship when she said that <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly now uh two places you mentioned that i wanted to ask about um hong kong um you know Hawaii, I believe Hong Kong, you can correct me if my geography is not good. These places that seem to be surrounded by water, they it seems like they're more active. Is Hong Kong surrounded by water? Yes, right? New Zealand. Yeah, is. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. 
do do you find them to be more active or you haven't compared them that way well i i I have found that kind of um scenario with water on land as well as as you know when you're talking because uh, there's a place in in um england um called chew valley lake and we've had a lot of activity around this lake and there's been a girl scene walking around and the person that saw us saw she was she was like a um it was almost like a hologram he saw this young girl skipping up a lane and he said you know i've never seen anything i never believed in she was like a hologram skipping up lane i almost crashed my car um and there's been a lot of activity about around this lake and water area and i found around the uk around lakes and land waterways whether that's because of folklore and mythology that people think of drowning and stuff like that and maybe mm. would see and, and that maybe it could be but yeah i do find sometimes that near water you find a lot of a lot of things are mentioned uh in in new zealand is a place i've never been to i've been to australia um but new zealand um where wh- where were you in new zealand or how was that do it's funny you guys australia in, and new zealand i think because we all speak english i feel like yeah it's all the same <laughs> yeah well, how was i mean new, new zealand new zealand's a little bit like a little england really i mean it's um but a but a warm wonderful place of england but um i got in a got in with a wonderful taxi driver he he took me um i said to him listen i i I have limited time but i've got a list of places to go and he was wonderful and um he took me to the places and and it was a bit longer than i anticipated and i thought well if i don't go back soon i'll miss the miss the ship Uh, (laughs) Um, which was always the problem but we went to a little school over there I, i I, I neglect the name of the school, but we went there and um, this teacher was hung and her body was said to drop from where she, she hung herself. And every now and then you could hear a, a bump as she, you know, her body came down and it was supposed to go on in this schoolhouse. And they said she did it because she was very upset about the children and what had happened to the children. So the people gave me a key and let me go in the schoolhouse. And I said to this rather nervous, nervous, a uh, taxi driver would you like to come in with me and see if we can hear the lady jump <laughs> bump and uh, he he was as nervous as nervous as anything but when he when i said i was going to write a book about all this eventually he uh, he did come in with a smile and said his name so i've got his name still um but um yeah we 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 um we we did go in there and and look for this um and that was a wonderful story and um it was like a holiday camp um you know like you think of these um you know these films where um you know, you think of Friday the 13th, you know, where they've got the camps where in the States, it was like that. And all the people around there, and I thought, what a fantastic place for them to do ghost hunting. You know, um, they've got this haunted school right on their doorstep. I thought it was funny. That's such a ghost hunter thing. You, you, you said the woman hung herself. It was such a wonderful story. And I, <laughs> that's well, <yeah. laughs> it's, it's terrible, isn't it? Because I mean, uh, I, I, as somebody as a former police officer, I've got you know I've definitely got empathy for people, and um, but sometimes we do say things like that, don't we? We don't. We obviously it's it's tragic story, but you know a wonderful. St- what I meant is the wonderful story right. around there, but I know, I know what you mean I know on what that. You meant. A wonderful yeah. <laughs> tale around the campfire or whatever. Yeah, perhaps not worried of the crime. <laughs> um, which is, which again is a, this is going to be a wonderful book. I know you, I did, I'm sure you're putting it all together, but uh, New Zealand, uh, Hong Kong, you said. So Philippines and Hong Kong are sort of these um, Asian. Um, they have a whole different belief system. Uh, do you find there's yeah. any, um, like that? I've never heard that one about the lady with the entrails and the shells. Um, do you, well, oh, do you, I was going to say, do you find any, um, likeness or any, um, things that sound the same, uh, in all yeah, I think, I, well, they, they do, but I think in, in China and Hong Kong and a lot of these, these places, they believe in, ancestral um you know they believe in the ancestral ceremonies they believe in um you know respecting their relatives they they they, they have an altar for their relatives they re- they do ancestral worship so they worship and remember their ancestors more than we do in the western world which is a beautiful ceremony that they do and they they believe the veil between life and death is very close i mean the one horrific thing which i'm uh researching at the moment is what happened in um 
in Japan when they had the um, that awful tsunami. Um, there has been a program already about it, the tsunami ghosts. Um, but when they had the tsunami over in Japan, after the tsunami, there was a lot of taxi drivers that were talking about picking up phantom hitchhikers. And they realized that it was people that were lost in the tsunami that wanted to find their home and they could no longer recognize where they lived because it had all changed. And um, it was very moving, you know, and the people and the taxi drivers were very moved because they lost relatives. And they said that they'd often have this, they saw the spirit like you and I see a person get in the back of the car and they knew that when they got to destination, it would disappear and they would pay their fare as a tribute because they knew that they were restless spirits and they took it for granted. And, and that was the same in China that, you know, a lot of it was taken for granted that, that this was around. I mean, over in China, I mean, they've got loads and loads of versions of ghosts. They've got the weird ghost, the trickster ghost, the drought ghost, the hungry ghost. Um, in in Vietnam as well, that's another fascinating place which I went to. They're very much worried that if somebody dies away from the home, their spirit's going to be restless. Um, so when there was a Vietnam War, they were very very conscious of trying to find the bodies of the you know the fallen. Wow, you know I had a friend, um, and she had. I think it was a hungry ghost situation and she eventually yeah. died. She had a cancer yeah. tumor that she was a tiny, tiny woman and it got so big and the, no one could figure out what it was. And we tried, um, we actually tried to move the ghost into an object. Um, and it yeah. had th yeah. that legend of hungry ghost came all from a couple of different cultures because she had gone to see a shaman and all this. She was doing everything non-Western medicine, which I, I think Western medicine said they couldn't do anything anyways. But it was, yeah. you know, somebody said, basically we were trying to make a haunted object, but we were trying to move it out of her. We were leaving meals out for it. Um, what have you heard about the legend of, of Hungry Ghost? Well, a lot of Buddhists... Um um, you've got a lot of Buddhists that do exorcism like that, where they try to move the body out. And they talk about hungry ghosts, where it's like a, a, it's almost like an appetite that can never be, you know, ever, and never be met, where the, they they torment the soul endlessly until the soul's drained, like you said. I mean, um, I had a friend of mine who was, um, she used to do um, distant um, healing, and um, she often told me that all my travels, I had a few attachments to me. And she was only a young woman, and she picked up things that I could not see, even though I'm a skeptic. She told me things that I thought, well, how does she know this? It's amazing. And sadly, I never got to actually go and visit her and do a proper, um, you know, uh, in person, she was going to do a past. She was going to do a past life regression with me, and I never went to do it. But sadly, she died of cancer, and um, she became very ill. And somebody said, "Was it all the energy she was taking on?" I mean, I don't know, but you know, it does. It does sometimes make you realize that you know when you hear these things that this isn't a game. You know, <laughs> that, yeah. that, that yeah. you know that there are serious sides to it. And it's not just um, you know, ghost hunters seem to think sometimes it's a hobby and it's just going out. And I see often, you know, people come out with me and they, the next minute they, they just won't go near it again, you know, because they realize there is a lot more to it. Yeah, there is in its energy. And, um, you know, it's very, that is such, that's a whole nother topic, but that was one of the things yeah. in, in, um, when, when the girl was channeling the demonic, uh, the, 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 it, it, he said something about, you, you have to be able to hold the space. And I think that's when people, and as, as you can tell, I'm over the top, I'm, I'm a skeptic, but not that much. Like I, I'll go right in there and, um, and, and yeah, yeah. sometimes he was saying how if you're going to conjure something, you kind of have to be able to hold the space for it. And the one really terrible, terrible thing that I was around that where someone really had an issue, I remember sitting in there and the whole time in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I know exactly who I am. I'm okay. I know who I am. Like I was holding on to my mind. And the other ghost hunter that was with me, what started wandering around she couldn't hold the space and i and all i could do was hold my space i couldn't help her and i think sometimes we do as um we as humans we feel like we're indispensable and it's not true yeah sometimes you can just work too hard and carry too much energy i wonder if that's what she did yeah well well when you think of 
people and you know we, we all know vampire friends you know the friends that are um bad for us um you know um and that give us negative energy and we have to you know the toxic type of um thing that happens with with friendship and you need to stay away from those kind of people i mean i've got people and relatives i've had to almost completely take out of my life because of the toxicity you know toxicity and the energy that's bad and um you know how that can affect a person so you're right i mean this this energy thing is a different subject completely but but is it is it different it's, it's probably on the same kind of grounds of what we do and you know and 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 um when we go out we have to be aware that you know there could be somebody that maybe not necessarily I mean, you only got to think of the evil people in the world that have murdered and committed crime. And if we go to a haunted location and we pick up that energy, we're going to pick up something not very nice. And, and that's where we have to be aware of that. Yeah, aware and cleanse and whatever. Uh, sometimes I wonder because I do, I do like four and five tarot readings a day in my business and I do Monday through Thursday yeah. and it wipes out my brain like nothing else. Yeah, and yeah. I always, if I die of a brain tumor, then you'll be like, she did too many readings. <laughs> well, I find, I find I do, um, if I do a lot of, you know, if, when I was doing my solo investigations, it's almost, I mean, it is, I mean, obviously this, um, this awful pandemic is, is a tragedy and it's kind of, it's terrible, but there's been one good thing that's come out of it. It's made me not go out as much doing – well, I can't go out and do what I do. And also it's made me center on what matters in life and and, um, and take time. Because when I used to go out and I used to do these locations, I used to get the exhaustion. And sometimes I used to get depressed if I was at a particular location. And somebody said to me, I said to the medium there, I said, I'm getting really depressed here and I don't know why. And they said, well, you're picking up on the atmosphere of what happened. And I said, well, yeah, maybe. And and, and I realized for days after I felt that feeling. So, yeah, it does. It does have that strong effect. Yeah, I know we went, uh, 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 what would very often happen, and for some reason it was almost always in theaters, uh, We, I'd be with a group, because when I do comedy, I'd, I'd find a group sometimes, and they'd show me places or something. I'd say, hey, you get free tickets to the show if you can show me. And a very common thing, and it's almost always the largest man in the group, and I don't know why, but um, the largest, toughest guy will suddenly say, I feel like I'm going to cry. And yeah, yeah. it's like something is standing way too close to them and they pick that up. It's never like an emotional woman. It's always like a guy. I don't know if that's yeah, something yeah. that just is because it seems funny to me like that, but it's like the last person. You no, no, it does. It. <laughs> it does seem amusing. I mean, because I've, I've experienced it myself, you know, and, and I've had people that, that have gone there all kind of um oh i'm not, i don't believe in ghosts i'm fine i'm not nothing's gonna happen to me and that's the one person that, that suddenly starts crying and and hiding behind you and that and and you have to and you have to say to them you almost have to remember that you know you've been doing it for a while and they've only just started doing it so you have to say it's okay to be like that don't worry don't worry you know um no one needs to know <laughs> right right it's part of the game you know you're in a different yeah. uh, a different zone well uh richard this is uh this was fantastic can you tell uh everyone uh where to find you yeah, you can find me on Facebook. It's, um, I do have a page, but also my personal Facebook's used a lot um, for what I do. Um, and that's uh, if you look up Richard Case, the Ghost Challenger, you'll you'll find me easily enough. Um, and also, you can find my website, which is www.theghostchallenger.co.uk. Oh, dot co. I got to remember that. Dot, dot oh, also, I have got yeah, I have got a Twitter apparently uh, at re- <laughs> real. No, I don't remember what it is. But if you look up Twitter and put the ghost challenge, you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, and wonderful. And when you get uh, your book together or or uh, anytime, just reach out to me. This was really, really fun. I will do. Lovely. Thank you. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks. We will see you next week. Um, and also thanks to Mike at Una Rising Media. Uh, all right, everybody. I will uh, see you next Friday.